Thank you. All right, once again, welcome everyone um, to our June webinar on user-friendly OER course design for remote and face-to-face. -face. This is Una Daly from the Community College Consortium for OER. And uh, we're very pleased to have you with us today. I wanted to start this webinar with just um, a few seconds of silence for the anguish and pain that's been going on in our nation over the last week, uh, reflecting back on the police brutality and some of the responses that have been made, which have created such uh, dissension and, and discord. So thank you for your patience for just a few moments to focus. Thank you. All right. Well, we're excited to have um, a large group with us today. Um, we had over 300 registrants. So we know that this is a topic uh, near and dear to everyone's heart. And OER is um, something that is a natural fit with online learning, as well as, of course, supporting face-to-face. -face. But um, we want to make sure when there's a decision to be made, about what materials to use when you need a digital material that OER is looked at first. And we have some wonderful speakers here today, which I will introduce to you in just a moment, who are gonna tell you how they do it at their campus and their institution. So we'll, um, we'll have a, a little discussion on backwards design with course mapping and how that lends itself to OER, and then um, universal design for learning and accessibility and how that is key for, all of our digital materials, regardless of whether it's OER or, or not. And finally, we'll have a talk on implementing OER design and accessibility at Oregon, at Portland State University, excuse me. Excuse me, Una? Yes. Uh, we have someone um, has a chat question. Okay, uh, that's great. Thank you, Val. Um, I'll ask uh, my I'll ask my community manager, Liz, to um, answer that. I suspect it's in the chat window. Yeah, the webinar does seem to be capped at 100. I was under the impression we had to upgrade your account, and I'm trying to figure out why it's not working. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, we are recording this and we will share the slides and, and the recording with um, not only those of you who attended, but those who um, were registered and, and couldn't attend. All right, so I wanted to introduce our speakers. First of all is uh, Dr. Scott Robinson. He's the Associate Director of Digital Learning and Design at, in the Office of Academic Innovation at Portland State University. So welcome, Scott. And thank then, you very much. Thank you for joining us today, Scott. Um, next up, we have Ben, and I hope I get this correct, Ben, Ben Contop. He's the instructional designer at the Colorado Community Colleges Online. Hi there. Thank you. That was pretty close. Okay. It's, it's, it's a tough one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did have German, but I don't know. About, maybe it's not German. All right. And uh, uh, last but certainly not least, I want to introduce Sophia Strickfadden who is the e-learning technologist at the Colorado Community Colleges Online. Hi, thank you. Welcome. Happy to be here. Wonderful. Welcome to all of you. All right. Very quickly, for those of you who might be new to CCC OER, our mission is expanding awareness and access to high quality OER. We've been around for over 10 years. We're going to be celebrating our 13th year here this summer. And um, OER looks very different. Uh, but expo expanding awareness and access um, in order to give faculty choices around what they use in their classroom and in order to improve student success and equity. Uh, one of our newer initiatives this last fall was around fostering regional OER leadership. And we continue to work on that project to provide uh, those of you who are working at the state and system-wide level um, guidance around OER and policy, et cetera. Um, here is our current set of members, and um, we are in 35 states, and um, our most recent members are Los Angeles Southwest College, SUNY Geneseo up in um, 
uh, up in New York, in case there was any question, and then Southeast Arkansas College, which of course is in Arkansas. And we were very pleased to have all of them join us, but uh, Southeast Arkansas is our first uh, college in Arkansas. Um, just a quick call out to our extraordinary stories. Uh, this is a, um, a website where we've been um, encouraging you to share uh, the responses that you and folks um, at your college or even in your community um, have how they've been addressing um, COVID-19 um, issues. Um, and we know that everyone is working our, many more hours than uh, they're being paid for, but they're doing this to make sure that the students are served and that our institutions continue. And I wanted to mention that OE Global, which is um, CCCOER's parent organization, uh, their tw our 2020 conference, which is scheduled for November 16th through 20th, will be virtual. So it, uh, we will have three hosts, uh, one in Taiwan, who is our main host, and where um, we were hoping to actually have a face-to-face -face conference in November, but unfortunately that's not possible now. So Taiwan will be Taiwan Medical University, eCampus Ontario up in Canada, and TU Delft in uh, the Netherlands will be our co-hosts. This is a wonderful opportunity for those of you who often can't travel internationally uh, for many reasons, and sometimes it's because your college won't fund that kind of travel. Um, this will be your opportunity to not only uh, participate in the conference, but also to submit, um, to submit and present at the conference. All right, and at this point, I want to turn it over to, uh, to Ben and Sophia to tell us about their work at the Colorado Community Colleges Online. Awesome. Can everybody hear me okay? We can. And would you like me to stop sharing at this point, Ben, or? Um, no, you're fine. Um, I think I will probably just grab the screen here shortly, um, but I'll just give a little introduction. Um, so. My name is Ben Contop, as was said, um, and with me is Sophia Strickfadden. Uh, we work for the Co Colorado Community Colleges Online, and we're a branch of the community college system here in Colorado, um, so that's why that logo is there. Um, and we're going to be talking today about uh, UDL principles, um, accessibility tips, uh, and just different things about uh, course mapping uh, and backwards design. Well, we'll go through our process and how that applies to OER. So if you, uh, if you wouldn't mind, just go into the next slide. Uh, we're going to start with a quick survey. Uh, and if you would like to take, take part, uh, just go to a new tab or window and to menti.com. And I'm going to share my screen. And you'll see a number that you can input. So I'm going to see if I can just grab the screen. All right. Can everybody see that OK? Yes, we can. Excellent. Good. So the number there is 837489. And uh, you'll have three questions. The first is out of the following topics, which one would you like to learn more about? Course mapping and backwards design, specific accessibility tips, uh, UDL skills, or nothing specific. Very good. Got a couple of responses in. Got... Okay. Okay, and I'll come back to that. I'm going to go to the next question. If it'll let me. There we go. And it's a word cloud. Uh, so what is one word that comes to mind when you think of backwards design? Could be anything. Hmm. Outcomes, objective, okay. I love word clouds. This is so interesting. Visual, nothing, what? <laughs> Passe, start with the end in mind. Good. All right, these are great. Blueprint, that's a good one. Blueprint, we'll be going into mapping, kind of similar. Yeah. All right, we'll do the last one then. Don't want to spend too much time on these, but uh, how much of a priority do you give accessibility when creating any online components of a course? Uh, high priority, medium, low, or you don't really know where to begin? 
could be anything, could be just a learning tool, could be as simple as the fonts that you put into your course or the background color. Interesting. Okay, I was expecting more of the yellow, so that's interesting. That's good to see that it's a high priority for folks. Okay. And then Una, should I just show the slides on my screen or would you like to take back over? Uh, it's really up to you. I think I, I welcome you doing that. Okay. All right. So that was an interesting little exercise. Thank you for taking part in that. Um, so as, as we said, me and Sophia are from CCC Online. That's Colorado Community Colleges Online. Uh, just a little bit of a background about us. We were established in 1998 and we had 52 online students and 450 telecourse students at that time. Those telecourse students, we, we would send them videotapes, basically VHS tapes, and they would take the course that way. So we've come a long way since then. Um, we're a service to the Colorado Community College system. And what that essentially means is uh, if a student, for example, at Red Rocks Community Colleges uh, needs to take a history course in the summer, uh, they and let's say their home college of Red Rocks doesn't offer it, they can take it with us and, and fill that credit requirement uh, with a, as it says here, a fully remote course in uh, Desire to Learn, D2L. In terms of OER, we've been building OER courses since about 2014, uh, but since 2017, a little point of pride here for us, um, we started collecting the data and we found that we've saved 54,353 students, over $2.8 million. Uh, and for us, that, that means an OER course for us means that the students have no textbook to pay for. Um, but there could be course materials costs, but uh, the most important thing is that we've found different OER resources for them. Uh, and then I'm going to move on over to the next slide. So what is backwards design? Uh, I think a lot of folks, I saw a lot of the responses on there. Some of them are saying blueprint, some of them are saying design with the end in mind. Uh, and those are all perfect, uh, but essentially speaking from straight from the source, from Wiggins and McTeague, uh, one starts with the end, the desired results, that is the goals or the standards, and then derives the curriculum from the evidence of learning, the performances, called for by the standard and the teaching needed to equip students to perform. So for us at CCC Online, we have a process whereby we, uh, especially during, most importantly during OER builds, uh, we have our subject matter experts utilize course maps. In our course map, let's just bring it up real quick. Our course map looks a little bit like this. You'll see we have various tabs at the bottom. Um, and in terms of OER, the most important ones to keep in mind here are the external resources and then the map itself. Um, but the most important thing for us, usually during the process, is this map. So we first have the, the first page here where we have the course details. These are pretty generic uh, for any course, uh, textbook or OER. Uh, and then the course description, which we get from the uh, common course numbering system, which is uh, universal for the system for each course. So if we have a history 121 course, the course outcomes for that course are going to be the same um, throughout the system. Uh, the fun part comes in when we get to the map and we have our subject matter expert design the course based upon those course outcomes. So you'll see here we have modules one through five. Generally speaking, we have five modules in, in a course, no matter what it is, OER or otherwise. Um, and the, each of those modules in a typical, typically linked course would be about three weeks long. So a 16 week course, we have about three weeks for module one, three for module two, et cetera. Ben, uh, could you make that screen just a little larger? Oh, sure, of course, yes. Is that a little better for everybody? Yeah, uh, definitely. Yeah. And, okay. And there is there is a request to get the template, so we might. Oh, good. Maybe, maybe you can share share that later in the chat window. Good. Yeah. Actually, that was something I was going to point out. We we will be sharing this out with everybody uh, in case you wanted to take something away from from our talk today. Uh, this is a great resource to use. Um, but anyway, so we're talking about module one here, and with an OER build, uh, it's important to well, it's important to always focus in on your module outcomes, of course. And for us, that's, I think, the beauty of OER. Um, with a, with a, a normal textbook, you do have that backbone. Of course, you can base different modules or different weeks of learning on the, let's say, the chapters of that textbook. Uh, but with OER, I think you have the freedom to really target module outcomes more specifically. 
So let's say we have a course outcome that um, is listed in the CCNS and uh, one of our module outcomes, uh, we actually wanna match it up with that one. We put it right here in this uh, box or the subject matter expert rather, we'll put it here. And then they'll match up the letter as seen here to the course outcome. So again, I think the beauty about it is they're able to target a little bit more specifically. Um, and we've had courses that not only use an OER textbook, which is a great resource, of course, uh, but we also have some, and um, it is a big ask, but we do have some where the, the subject matter expert is actually building the course themselves, almost writing a textbook themselves. And I know that's a lot to ask for a subject matter expert, but I think we, we have the good fortune of having some really good ones, and um, they are more than happy to write the content. Um, be it having uh, resources sprinkled in and then they have their own voice or something that they're just pulling their own knowledge uh, and writing a textbook, essentially speaking. So we have our module outcomes there. Uh, our topics here, this is especially important for an OER course so that we, we don't stray. Of course, one of the things with OER is that you can have a tendency to find a million different wonderful things, but uh, if they're not fitting in with the outcomes that you have set, uh, they're not really worthwhile. So just putting something in just for the sake of putting it in is kind of what we wanted to avoid when we say, so what topics are we going to be talking about here? And then specifically what reading assignments tied to those topics are we going to be talking about? Uh, and then beyond that, we have our exploration concepts. And generally, um, uh, for a long time, we had explorations for textbook courses, not OER, uh, that were essentially a deeper dive for the subject matter expert to do. So like I was saying, if you have the baseline of a textbook uh, and then you wanted to go into something a little bit deeper, let's say if it's a biology course and uh, the subject matter expert doesn't feel very satisfied that they're not talking about, um, we'll say, uh, the diversity of life of some kind or or maybe um, microbiology, you know, if there's a specific uh, module that they want to talk about that and the book just doesn't really cover it, this is where explorations would come in. Uh, for OER courses, however, exploration concepts are essentially speaking, uh, unless they're doing an OER text, exploration concepts are going to be the content delivery. Um, so what are the things the students are going to be learning in that module? Um, I kind of like to think of this whole column as a bit of a just an upside down triangle in a way. So you're starting very broadly, right, with the course outcomes, and then you're kind of narrowing down as you go. So we have the course outcomes, how are they tied to the module outcomes, topics, and then more specifically, what are they going to be reading, and then assignments, what are they going to be doing or discussing or um, being quizzed on. So it's a great tool. Um, it's something that we try and emphasize uh, for our subject matter exp experts to really design, we have that design with the end in mind. Think about what you want your students to do before you start diving into content building. Um, it's a roadmap that we utilize throughout the build, throughout the entirety of the build. Um, and remember that, that these are purely online courses. So uh, it's easy to have a little bit of scope creep uh, in terms of um, a subject matter expert building an OER course. So this kind of keeps them, keeps them in line a little bit and keeps them uh, remembering what they have to cover. Uh, one of the other kind of fun tools about this is uh, the estimated time. So as I'm sure multi, uh, many of you know, the Carnegie credit hour, we have to have a certain amount of work for students to be doing depending on the amount of credit hours. Um, and for a three credit course, that's generally about 135, 135 in seat hours. Um, it gets a little bit tricky because again, we are fully online. So it's hard to say what the quote unquote in seat would be, but uh, this is a kind of a nice tool to keep the subject matter expert, uh, again, kind of in line and just making sure that they're not straying too far. So if they enter in the number of hours that a student will be doing or what they guesstimate a student will be doing, it will actually populate over here. And so if they see, oh, yikes, I have a 30 hour reading in just the first module, I may want to pump the brakes on that. Um, so it's a great tool and it's very useful for them to kind of visualize uh, where they're going in terms of the course, the workload for students. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to point out this external resources. Uh, this is a really great tool for when uh, building OER courses, you can keep all of the material uh, in kind of the same place. It's kind of like a one stop shop. So if a, if a subject matter expert is building it out and they kind of forgot what they had put in module two or what they were going to put that great article from, you know, the Atlantic or something. 
they can always come back to this and find it. Uh, not only do they have the citation for, for us when we're building it out and when we need to cite the source, uh, they have the resource link, so the actual location of it. And actually, I'd like to just show really quickly uh, a couple of examples. And, One is the, and I'm sorry, go you ahead. You could continue to increase, every time you switch screens, it goes back to the lower resolution. Oh, it goes back low, I'm sorry yeah. about that. Thank you. Yeah, I can. So in the course map, that's a good point. So this is kind of what it looks like here. Uh, just in the template, uh, it gives you an example. And then I'll go to one that's actually filled out, kind of give you a better visual. Um, I don't know if everybody can see that okay, but this but, is from an, that's okay? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is from an English uh, 221 course. And you can see that the subject matter expert did a great job of not only citing the sources that she'd found, uh, but she actually put the link in as well. So it's just, again, a one-stop shop, a great tool for uh, our, our SMEs to use. Um, and then to actually kind of finish it off a little bit, I'll show you a filled out map. And here I'll zoom in a little bit so everybody can see this. Uh, starting with the course details. So pretty generic, pretty straightforward. This is gonna be pretty similar, no matter what, if you're doing OER or not. Um, because this will always be from the CCNS, our, our main system office. Once uh, again, and, increase the oh, size. Oh, sorry, did it again. <laughs> I'll learn eventually. So this is just kind of a general idea of what the course is, is going to be covering, the course description, and then the course outcomes that they need. And then here we have the map itself. So we have module one, what course outcomes that she expects to cover in the module. And then the, the module outcomes themselves, this is uh, written straight from the SME. Uh, and she's, as you can see, kind of matched the letters up to what course outcome she feels would, uh, would align. So, and then again, we have here um, the topics. So we're, we're not straying too far. We have a, a basic idea of what module one, what the students are gonna be covering. Uh, the reading assignments, uh, it's kind of tricky for this one because the reading assignments and the explorations, as I was saying, are pretty much the same thing. That's kind of our content delivery system. So as she says, uh, explorations built with OER. Uh, and then she used, uh, uh, she used a lot of um, smart history. Uh, it's a really great website and a lot of uh, Khan Academy as well uh, when using or when building her uh, content. But in addition, she had the, uh, the added benefit of just using her own knowledge to kind of supplement. So uh, she was really able to target these uh, outcomes so well. And, and I think Sophia may talk about this course just a little bit and show an example of it. Um, so essentially speaking, that is how we do our backwards design. Um, we're building our own roadmap uh, for the course. And like I said, this is something that we go back to all the time uh, during a build. And it's something that I think is, is so useful and you don't really, it's become such an ingrained part of our build process that um, we almost take it for granted, but Without these, I think we would, uh, especially with the OER courses, we would really stray off, I think, a little bit too far. And it's so easy for that to happen with, with OER builds because there's just so much out there and you're so excited about using it all. And um, this keeps you grounded. This keeps you uh, at the thousand foot view. And um, yeah. So next, I think I'm gonna hand things off to my partner in crime, Sophia. While you're gonna... handing that over to Sophia, Yes. I want to ask you a question. So you as the instructional designer, you manage that, uh, that sheet and then the, um, the SME or the subject matter expert uh, comes in and, and um, edits it to put in materials or how, do, how does that work? So uh, it's actually kind of an interesting process for, especially for our OER builds. Um, the OER builds start um, at least a year in advance. Uh, we have uh, our dean, our academic dean, of the particular course that needs to be built will designate this course is going to be OER. And then um, we actually have uh, our great librarian. I give a shout out to Brittany Dudek, who is amazing in kind of utilizing and, and helping out our subject matter experts find these great resources. So she'll come up with some resources for this me. Um, generally speaking though, the subject matter experts will have some ideas in their head of what they wanna do uh, and where they wanna go in terms of OER. Um, but it is kind of a big ask. I mean, OER, is, it's a big, big process. So you have to really give it enough time and put enough uh, effort into it. Um, but generally speaking, when we first start a build and I first get contact with a SME, that's called our vision meeting. 
And so we kind of go over the map and I explain all the things I'm basically doing right now, um, well, how it works, you know, um, what they're going to be inputting. Uh, and then generally speaking, after that vision meeting, I'll ask them to maybe write just one module in the course map. So they'll just do one column uh, and they'll come up with the content. Um, basically speaking, they don't have to have it all at that point in time, but they'll just come up with basically the module outcome that they expect to have, how it ties to the course outcome, and then some general idea of you know the topics that they want to talk about um, and those kinds of things. And then after the vision meeting and after I see that they've done pretty successfully a module, uh, then they can do the rest of the map. We'll have a second meeting called a kickoff, and that's where we really go over the map together. and uh, We get a good idea of where this course is going to go. Um, Great. So we, that sounds like it's a collaboration. Oh, yes. Yeah, 100%. Um, I think that's really important. Yeah. Yes, yeah. And it's a constant process throughout the build. You're, you're checking up with your SME, making sure things are going okay. Um, and once the course map is kind of approved and we moved on past that and they start building their content, it's, it's, it's so helpful to have the map and say, well, you know, this doesn't really quite match up with what you wanted to have. Uh, and so if it's something that, yeah, we, we can change the map, we can add this to it. Uh, that's something that's just as easy to do. Just go into the map and change it. So it's a great tool to have. So. Great, thank you so much. Sure. Wonderful, I'll jump in. Uh, thank you, Ben. So I'll touch on a few things that I think Scott will be touching on um, later with his real, uh, real life experience as well. Uh, and that is to define accessibility versus universal design for learning. Because on top of the course mapping process, we also have guidelines for accessibility and universal design for learning. So accessibility is really taking any space, whether it's physical or digital, and making it available to as many individuals as possible, often with assistive technology, such as a screen reader or a wheelchair ramp. Universal design for learning is more abstract. It's, it's a research-based set of principles that impact the design and implementation and learning environments. So this is regardless of disability or designated need, we don't have learners who have to disclose that they need a certain thing. We're just building something from the beginning that meets as many needs and choices uh, that we can. Where you usually see accessibility is where a barrier exists. So for instance, when you have someone who can't use a mouse, um, being able to navigate an online course or learning environment with the tab key or the arrow keys and the enter key on the keyboard is really important. Um, universal design for learning, again, is a little more abstract, but includes some of these choices and how the, the learners navigate their digital environment. And typically these are broken into three categories, engagement, representation, and action and expression. And the best way to sort of look at all of this and see whether or not you're doing something, something in UDL that is compatible with accessibility and ADA is to use the Universal Design for Learning Guidelines rubric. So this is on the cast.org website, and this will be a link that we can put in the chat too. But essentially, you're looking at all these different levels based on what part of the brain is stimulated and thought of when you're designing different concepts. So for engagement, we're looking at the why of learning. Why are we learning about art history? The what of the learning, what is happening at this point in art history? And then the how of learning. How are you as a learner going to present your knowledge and skills effectively to let me know that you've met the learning outcomes? So um, a lot of this has, has a, a nuance in providing variety in choice, variety in visual representation, variety in um, assignment submission styles. So whether you have a student who's doing a PowerPoint or an infographic or a narrated video, um, those are all choices within the universal design for learning environment. Now, they're not always compatible. Um, so that's just something you have to pay attention to. Some of it is uh, having a quality assurance process, which you can see in the bottom left of this image. So this graphic gives the accessibility in UDL layers that we utilize in our community college system to um, give us guidance from the beginning. It's really a proactive mapping process. 
just as Ben explained, there are um, resources and files and spreadsheets that we use to collaborate, especially with our subject matter experts who are often instructors of the courses. So one of the things that we make sure happens is for OER courses, in that OER resources tab in the course map spreadsheet, we have our quality matters um, check go through before we build anything in the learning management system to make sure that all of those open educational resources are actually compatible with our accessibility and um, universal design for learning guidelines that we, we follow. So here's some of the fun part. I'm going to show you some live examples of where the OER uh, course mapping process has turned into concrete digital environments. So the first one actually is a biology course. And this was built with Articulate Storyline, which some of you are probably familiar with. Really, it's just a content authoring tool that gives you a step-by-step -step or branching scenario or navigable specific experience is a good way to say it. The best way to show you how we built in accessibility here is to show you the question mark in the bottom right of this window. So when I hover over it, a little window, which you might not be able to read, pops up and says accessibility notice. If I click on it, it says for accessibility, you may press the tab key to access the content in this interactive with your screen reader. If you need to access the menu at any time, please press control plus M. All right, so I'll close that and then I'm going to use my keyboard. So when I use my keyword, a yellow box appears around what is selected. So this is, if I was using a screen reader, uh, this is what would be read. So it would read the module one exploration and then the speech bubble. If I click tab again, it highlights the next button, which is really hard to see on a webinar. I know, but just imagine a little yellow box around the next button. If I click enter, it'll take me to the next slide. And the yellow box has moved to the wider white frame. So that's where my screen reader would read next. So that's one example. The next, next example is an art history course. This is actually the course that was built based on the course map that Ben shared earlier. So this is ex exploration number two in module one. And this was built using Articulate Rise. And what has been um, built here is all of the open educational resources selected by the subject matter expert has been, um, they've been curated and combined into this one element within the course. So there's a table of contents. The student can click anywhere to get started. And there are accessible videos with closed captions, images with alternative text or captions. Uh, readable text compatible with a screen reader. Articulate Rise is automatically accessible. Uh, there are some things that you have to do, like write the alternative text for the images for it to be compliant. Um, but otherwise, it's a really easy tool to, to utilize and navigate within this digital accessible open educational environment. The third example is a hand-built e-text. We had uh, an instructor for this history course that uh, adopted the American YAP by Stanford University Press Edition and just licensed it under their own Creative Commons license. This is also responsive, which is one of the things that UDL asks for. So we can view it as an iPad. The students would be able to click through and scroll. Um, we understand that there aren't a lot of graphics in here. That's This is still sort of a work in pro process. Um, but it's, it's fairly easy to navigate and it's something that is e easily embedded within the D2L learning management space. All right, so <laughs> that was sort of fast paced and um, I'm sure we'll have time for questions later. Um, but otherwise, it is Scott Robinson's turn to talk about how they've um, been doing this at his institution. Well, we're switching to Scott there, Sophia. I wanted to ask you, um, the um, what was the software that you were using that was identifying um, the the screen reader focus points, the focus windows? What was the software? Yeah, was that something built into your browser? Um, it's it's something that was built into um, the 
the storyline component that we built with Articulate Storyline, when you click tab, there's a way to make sure that the ordering of when you click tab, the ordering of the things that are selected are uh, in the correct order. Correct. So it's not really the software as much as a, a setting. Okay, in the Articulate Storyline. I gotcha. Yes. And making sure it's, yeah, navigating the right way. Yeah, thank you for that. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes, welcome, Scott. Great. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you, Sophie and Ben, for that amazing work and a just phenomenal uh, explanation of um, some really important issues and with accessibility and uh, universal design for learning. Um, that, yeah, a, a great work. And what I thought I would do is to try and um, build on that a little bit and perhaps zoom out a little bit and to, to explain um, how we try and do very similar things at Portland State University. Um, Portland State University is, is uh, about 26,000 students, but just to compare with the um, more online schools, uh, we have about 25% of our student credit hours uh, are, are online, but relatively few completely online students. Uh, let's jump to the next slide. Um, and, and kind of thinking about like, how does this work actually get done or how is it supported at an institution? I hope it's helpful just to uh, share a quick slide on, on my office, uh, the Office of Academic Innovation, um, and then kind of go through a, just a couple bullet points um, talking about um, the work of doing this, um, accessibility and uh, UDL and OER, and how that how OER is kind of tied into that and some of the issues that we've come across and, and worked through. And then um, it's hard to, lastly, it's hard to, to talk about some of this um, work, especially as we transition from emergency to remote to potentially online courses in the fall. Um, we, we have to acknowledge the impact that, that COVID is having on that. So real quickly, and there's probably more information on this slide uh, than most of you uh, need, but the, the point is, is that we wouldn't be able to do the work that, that Sophia and Ben are doing in, in this very um, intensive course design process without a pretty um, well-developed, uh, what, what we have is essentially a Center for uh, Teaching and Learning or our Office of Academic Innovation, which is made up of three kind of groups that collaborate. We're all housed in one place, but we have a, a traditional educational development or teaching learning uh, team. We have uh, my team, the digital learning and design, the, 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 the course creation or the course design group. And then we also have just the faculty support desk. So, you know, help, uh, like a help desk. And we're all in one place and it's the only place on campus that faculty come for for support. And so it's, it's about six years old, and I've been at two other institutions where this model was tried um, and didn't really work. <laughs> and so I understand uh, that, that pulling this off could be a challenge at some institutions, but I, I, I could not, we, we could not handle the scale of work that we do along the lines of accessibility, um, thoughtful course design, um, and, and OER without what kind of the, this robust team um, working together in, in multiple ways. Uh, I do want to say something about the, the uh, very thoughtful design that Sophia and Ben are talking about and that, that um, as they've alluded to, takes a lot of time. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do that work in a compressed amount of time. And a lot of what we're being asked to do now as we prep for summer and potentially fall is to think about how we can improve the, the courses, um, especially in a fully remote um, situation. Typically, our, our online course design is, is about a 10 to 12 week development cycle, um, which, you know, sometimes it goes longer than that. And, and so that gives you some idea of like how, how long it takes to do some of this work with uh, a, a involving a, a number of, of staff, including instructional designers, user experience designers, multimedia um, professionals, and so on. 
And as uh, Ben mentioned, it's an iterative process. So that, that first 10 week development and the first time that co course is offered is likely not gonna be the way that course ends up, right? It's, it's just gonna keep evolving. <clears throat> so all that to say, um, when we think about incorporating OER into a course, which we always try, we always try and bring up that topic when we're, when we're working with faculty, we found that it can be th just doing that lift of, of, of utilizing OER can be a lift. And we've been very fortunate for, uh, very fortunate that our library has been able to create a, a grant program in order to um, help faculty to do that work. Um, as you can see, it, there's just a few different levels depending on kind of the, the amount of work it would require. Uh, starting with something that, where they're just adopting a textbook, an OpenStax textbook, or whether they're taking that and adapting it, and maybe it's gonna influence the way they do their labs, and so that may take much more time. Kind of the longest time frame, which is well over a year, is if they're actually creating a textbook. Um, we have, I put it in the resources, that slide will be coming up later at the end, but um, PDX Open, uh, is our open repository for for textbooks and we have about 25 textbooks that have been offered so far and that's a it's a rather substantial uh, substantial commitment but we understand that that um, it is real work um, speaking to um, OER and and access and accessibility um, Ben and uh, Sophia have made some uh, good points. Um, I, I think our goal, right, with all of this, uh, especially when we think about OER and open resources, is that we're helping students um, increase access to resources. I, that's one of our driving driving goals. But, the, but at the same time, it's, it's not perfect, right? Um, especially during this time, we've seen uh, how we, we, it's been, it's surfaced how uh, students are uh, they do have real issues with accessing digital material. And for the most part, our OER is accessed digitally. They obviously have the option to pay for a print version, which is much, much cheaper, and that's great. But um, we've, as we've moved to remote this spring, um, it's just been very apparent that there's a, a chunk of students that have, you know, they're, they have no, uh, no laptop or they're just accessing courses on their phone, um, you know, how, how can we be at least mindful about making um, resources as accessible as possible in all these variety of ways that students have now to access them or only have uh, the ability to access them in certain ways. Again, I, um, as, we, as we go into the summer, um, you know, as we think about these students that are facing additional challenges, the majority of those challenges are, are forces from outside the classroom, right? We, our, our surveys are showing that it's, it's less about the actual academic work and more about how do I get access and time and, and resources to, um, to, to function in the classroom when all these other life events are happening. I just wanna take a pause there and, and, and put that front and center, at least for us, is that we feel like um, during COVID, we, we really, in what ways can we really be attentive to students that are facing these um, particular challenges? And, and for us, uh, you know, the, the remote versus the online issue has been a sticky point for our campus. Um, we just finished our um, faculty survey feedback from uh, spring term. And um, like I said, about 25% of our, our, our courses are taught online. And of those 25% that were taught online in the spring, over 84% of the faculty teaching those fully online courses made changes to their courses or to the way they facilitate them. And I think that's one of the most interesting things of the survey is that Online courses aren't necessarily, and, and I'm sure most of you know this, but online courses aren't necessarily um, immune, pardon the pun, to COVID, right? Um, 
their students have a lot of other things pressing in on them that they wouldn't otherwise, or that they wouldn't have, that they didn't plan for um, pre-COVID. And, you know, that, again, that, that helps us uh, be sensitive to the faculty's e effort as well as we think about how can they, um, how can they improve that remote learning experience without adding more things to their plate? Because if, if there's one thing that came out of the survey, it was loud and clear is that, as you know, faculty are at, at their end of the rope as far as the amount of time or energy they have to make, to learn things or make additional changes. And as, as, as we're doing it again in the summer, and, and I think it's a great idea, we're, we're putting out a call to ask for faculty if they'd be interested in um, changing out their textbook for an OER, for open textbook, because we know it's gonna help, in, in most cases, it's gonna help students access that material. But at the same time, we, you know, that's a, that's a significant amount of work for most faculty to do as well. So, that, you know, we have to be careful the way we, we present those options to faculty and, and be very mindful of, of their time. On top of that, there is also, um, you know, the, the, the limitations that um, OAI, our office, is faced with. Um, we just received a notification last week that our entire office of 20, five uh, faculty and staff are, are at 32, you know, 20% furlough. So we'll be off every Friday, technically. Um, and so how do we, <laughs> moving forward, how do we think about how can we best support faculty and ultimately students with a greater reduction in institutional support? Um, so, you know, I, I, we could not be more um, excited about OER and, and increasing student access, um, it, especially in this time. It's just that we, we do want to acknowledge that you know, there, there are challenges. People, people are working harder than ever and um, we, we wanna be sensitive to that. And to, to kind of have that balance, I think is where we're still trying to figure out um, what, what is working best um, and, and, and how to move forward. Um, but I think we're 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 making some strides in that in that way, and you know much of the future is unknown. But um, we we're sticking together, and and hopefully we can get through this together. I don't have uh, much else, and I'll let someone else transition into the question and answer. But um, I wanted to make sure we left time for at least a few questions and questions. Thank you, Scott. Um, we did have a couple of questions in the chat window. Um, one of you, one was a little bit theoretical, I guess, or it. Um, this was from Sophia. She asked, uh, "What's the benefit of having emerging technology under faculty support, and not digital learning and design?" Uh, what was the sorry? What was the distinction? Faculty learn. Uh, uh, emerging technology is under the under the faculty support hierarchy rather than the digital learning and design. Right in your Venn diagram. Um, there there is a lot of crossover and collaboration. Um, I think the the original uh, the way those bubbles were drawn be, was because of the way those offices originally started. They were three different offices, and. Um, so it was the six years ago, it was the coming together of those three different units, support, teaching, learning, and assessment, and the instructional design kind of, kind of team. Yeah, if that's helpful. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, you mentioned that 84% of what would be current online instructors, so those who normally teach online, changed their courses this spring to address COVID. And um, I wondered if you might, talk a little bit about that and then t you didn't mention um in detail anyway how you got everybody else online did you did you want to address that a little bit uh sure real quick um uh so yes 84 percent of those instructors that taught at least one fully online course spring term made made significant changes to their online course i think there was a perception that well if you're teaching online you're going to be fine like there's nothing you need to do well in fact that was not true at all, right? Instructors made dramatic changes 
uh, primarily spending more time interacting with students, right? Um, and and being more flexible with assignment dates, due to, you know, the number of assignments, the scope of things. And that was our shift. Uh, that was probably a shift that people didn't acknowledge was real and took, took work and was very much needed. Um, the, the, the other courses were shifted from, you know, face-to-face -face or hybrid to what we called remote, which was essentially utilizing Zoom or something similar to kind of replicate the lecture or uh, content. Um, and, and we acknowledge that, you know, that was kind of an emergency shift and now we're trying to move to what's next, what's beyond Zoom, right? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's see, I'm looking for other questions in the um, in the chat window. Um, let's see. So Una, there's a, there's a question from Amy Lansing that says, are other colleges increasing training instructors for instructors online over the summer? Oh, thank you. Any Amy. changes to that training due to the current situation? And I can answer on our behalf. Um, we just finished our first round of a very rapidly built course called The Essentials of Online Teaching that gets into this backwards design, but not quite into as much detail as our course mapping process. And the idea is that anyone in the community college system, not necessarily specific to the colleges online, but anyone in the community college system, uh, can sign up for this course. So we're starting another session on Monday and um, there's a very small stipend for uh, instructor benefit, um, excuse me, incentive to complete the course. Um, but it, yeah, so that's what we're doing from our end. Um, and we do have a Center for Academic Excellence that always offers um, training and support and webinars and things. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Sophia, for sharing that. And I know quite a few colleges have um, taken their um, getting online uh, course uh, for faculty and um, trimmed it a little bit for summer because they want everyone to go through it. Um, what might normally be, you know, a 10 week course, they've cut it down a bit. Um, oh, and here, yeah, Megan is sharing from Raritan Valley that. Uh, the training schedule has not been rolled out, but there there will be. Um, and uh, Rebecca at AC, I don't know what AC is, Rebecca, if you wanna share with us what that AC stands for. Um, we're glad to see that you have online training scheduled before the COVID-19 started, and then it was enhanced, she said, after spring break. Um, CCCOER is gonna be offering some short 30-minute uh, tutorials throughout the summer to our members. So um, we'll, we'll keep you posted on that. Um, <laughs> what is beyond Zoom? <laughs> a very good question, Joseph. And um, Nora Zapeta from East LA says they're holding a summer academy that uh, addresses building community and best practice for online teaching at East Los Angeles. Thank you for sharing that, Nora. And <laughs> I think that was a joke, Amy, right? That after Zoom is WebEx. Um, <laughs> I think that the order might be different. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I just wanted to mention that um, this is the last uh, webinar in our spring series. We'll be starting back up in, um, in August. If you missed any of our spring webinars, uh, the archive is there um, on our website. At, uh, that there is, you can go directly to that bit.ly, CCCOER, Spring 2020. The archives for all our webinars are available. Um, and we do thank, um, the wonderful speakers who come in from our community to share their expertise with everyone. Um, if you're not on our community email and you would like to attend these events on a regular basis and hear about other things that are happening in the open community, please uh, join our community email. We have many um, other networks that post on our community email list as well to share information. And we're always looking for equity, diversity, and inclusion blogs. Um, blog posts and student OER impact stories uh, that you would like to share on our site. So contact us um, and Liz and I will put our email addresses in the chat window so that you can um, you can contact us if you would like to participate and um, have an, a guest blog posting on our site. 
All right. I would love to go back to really quick since we have a few more minutes, the mm -hmm. beyond zoom question. Um, Please go ahead. The, Sophia. Yeah, so so there's sort of these different levels to remote instruction and, and one of those is you literally take what you were going to do in class and you deliver it through a web conferencing tool. So going beyond that, so going beyond Zoom, you would do something like build explorations into your course or you could simply record small segments of your lecture or your material or whatever um, would have happened in the live environment and put it into a short video segment. Um, and I say short because attention spans and navigation and bandwidth, there are all these things to consider when you're turning something into a digital format. Um, and Scott's giving it <laughs> me a thumbs up. Um, so for instance, an hour and a half lecture in person um, is much a much different experience um, in the online environment, partially because you're introducing internet speed, computers, hardware quality, um, the number of people that are connected to the internet in a given space or zip code or service, whatever. Um, and that's something we're seeing actually with everyone being remote right now um, is that our internet providers and bandwidth has significantly decreased. So um, that's sort of what going beyond Zoom is, is hinting at is creating these asynchronous experiences that give the students the opportunity to learn at the time that they need to at the pace that they prefer. Thank you, Sophia, for that really thoughtful um, explanation about moving from that synchronous Zoom model to an asynchronous model where students can access things at the time that they need them. Um, and um, there was a question in here about the course map and uh, Ben is going to email that over to Liz and I and we will um, we will make sure that we include that with the slides and the recording message that will go out to everyone who registered. Um, at this point, um, I want to thank once again our speakers, uh, Scott from Portland State and Ben and Sophia from um, the Colorado Colleges Online. Um, this was uh, extremely helpful, um, informative, and topical. Uh, you know, fresh off the, fresh off the, uh, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but recent recent data, which is can be really useful for everyone. So thank you all so much uh, for joining us, and thank you to all of you who came today. I think we had something close to about 120 folks uh, who attended. And uh, we'll stay online for a little bit longer, but we can stop the recording, Liz. And um, if you wanna continue to ask questions in the chat window, please, please do so.